welcome everybody um, to uh, this evening's webinar. Um, as usual, we have people from around the world, which has become a feature of these webinars. Uh, so it's very exciting to see you all here. Um, and uh, we've got uh, a treat for you, I think, this evening with uh, Sigmar Gherkin um, talking about love, light and consciousness. How can we embody a state of love in the flow of life? Because this is, as you know, it's really essential to mystical and near-death experiences that, um, <clears throat> that we're, we're interested in um, as a network. And Sigmar, I met in Italy um, about three years ago when we were both at a meeting organized by the Laszlo Institute, uh, the one I think we organized together. Yeah. And, and so uh, we, we, we had long talks at that point and we've been in contact um, ever since. And you'll see from his biography that, that he's widely uh, studied, as it were, in terms of psychology, education, and anthropology, uh, somatics. Uh, and uh, she, he talks about the interconnectedness of psychosomatic processes as they manifest at different levels. And, and he's also led change management uh, workshops, the Norwegian Defense University College, interesting. And another interesting feature, at least for me, is the work that he's been doing, did with uh, Professor Fritz Albert Popp on coherence and psycho-emotional states. Um, he was one of the uh, pioneers in biophotons. And, and so um, uh, this is um, you know, a very important area, as is the body psychotherapy, um, which is one of his main concerns. And, and so um, <clears throat> you'll, you'll see um, how he connects up um, these challenges in consciousness, ecology, in mind, body, and environment in the course of the evening. So Sigmar, a very warm welcome, and we're very much looking forward to what you have to share with us. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, boy, it sounds like a really white evening and a white topic. So let's see how we can bring it in. First, again, let me repeat greetings to you all in the many parts of the world. I trust that especially in these days that you are in good health. So having joined and being part of the Bethlehem family here, uh, I not only feel that we are a gathering of kindred spirits, but I also feel it like a heartwarming presence very often. So that I feel I can directly dive in with you. And diving in, I start directly uh, about my near-death experience when I drowned with five years old. That initiated my path to search for meaning and to fulfill my intention that I had formulated then to bring light into people's body and lives and to live and work in the spectrum of spirituality, love, and knowledge, and consciousness, of course. And of course, that I had no idea what that meant at that time. However, my search then led me very early to teachers like Krishnamurti and David Bohm, shamans and scientists worldwide, culminating then in the meeting with a physicist, Professor Pop and his research on biological light. Now I'm teaching in my own institutes for energy and consciousness and the therapy training institute of coevolution where I lecture on consciousness, the body, love, light, and other related topics, besides having my psychotherapeutic practice. So like we all here, I still search for a deeper understanding of love and life. And when we talk about consciousness, light and love, we are not talking about something abstract. We talk about processes of life and the subjective experience of love and consciousness. That means we are sensing and feeling beings. And therefore, I need to expand the topic and include the process of embodiment, our personal development, the flow of life, and we set, of course, a state of love. Love, like all other words that have a larger than life meaning, like soul, essence, 
God or other are often giving an attribute so that we can project our feelings, our images onto them, and then we can relate to them in a personalized way. So, for instance, I would give some example, and that's where I share my screen. So, <clears throat> let me blend this and out here. So, yes, where you see love, light, and consciousness. So, as I said, we project images and our feelings onto a term that's larger than life, and that we do that the same with the concept or with the understanding of love. So, for instance, evolutionary love or sustaining love, and true love or mutual love or endearing love romantic love or spiritual love and what do we understand with that maybe we give it an image okay or coming back to our human dimensions consummate love you know? or as the psychology dictionary describes love as an intense feeling to the exclusion of others you know? okay. so right as we can see, with all the endless attributes, we can now project our subjective attitudes and ideas onto love. And we set our personal value systems, which act like filters through which we then see and color our reality. Of course, we are interested then when we hear about some objective approaches. And these days we try to wishfully find objective answers in neuroscience. Research with the title The Brain on Love or similar then find great interest in the media. And as we will see, it can be very misleading. For instance, being in love shows an activity in the ventral to mental area, the VTA area, and in other areas that are rich with dopamine that we also sometimes call the feel-good neurotransmitter. In this mentioned research, they showed images of people's partners or ex-partners while they were in an fMRI and they made their conclusion from there. So what do scientists really want to state when they claim to objectively measure a state of love that has already been made subjective by making it romantic love, in showing images that have tremendous complex and undifferentiated emotional charges and information for the person. It's of course sensational, I understand. So if you want to explore the complexity of this question in a different way, you may be interested to read my interview, just inquire, and my office will send it to you. It's too long to go into it right now. So another research tried to explain why after rejection by females, males tend to go for alcohol or other stimuli to satisfy their reward system. And when we read headlines like that, we always think that it relates to men and women. But when I inquired a little bit deeper into this research, it turned out that it was about Drosophilia melanogaster, the common fruit fly. So after males had been rejected by females, they preferred sugar water that had alcohol in it, compared to the control group who could roam with virgins and afterwards stayed with sugar water and did not go for the alcohol. Well, I may not have the authority to discuss the consciousness of <laughs> fruit flies, but I do know that we have achieved an evolutionary state 
in which we gained insight into life processes that allows us to reflect in a complex, empathic, and meaningful way the topic and the experience of the state of love, which involves our full complexity of who we are. In general, we perceive harmony and the flow of life as states of being. When we are in the harmonious flow of life, we often describe this experience as being in a state that we perceive as love. So love is a resonance with the flow of life. Normally I like to make my lectures and workshops also experiential and but by time so that the theory and the understanding can develop out of the experience. I would see how we get by time maybe a possibility. But with love being the resonant with the flow of life, I see love independent and free of all philosophies romantic ideas or personal attributes. When you are aware about this state, then you can also sense, I'm in a state of flow. I'm in a state of love. If you now want to consciously share this perception of love, you may express, I share my love with you, others, and the world, like I do right now with my lecture and with my energy. However, if you now want to expand the state of love with the expression, I love you, and I want to experience life with you, then we meet on the interpersonal and intersocial level, and that is where the rubber hits the road, where we say. And where we not only meet our beauty and our qualities, but we also face the difficulties and limitations of our personalities and our egos. Then the open flow of energy, which is carried in our pulsation of being, often becomes restricted, interrupted, or distorted. And with that, we limit our capacity to give and to receive love. Here you find a basic uh, theory of our work in, our, in one graphic. On YouTube, there is about 50 minutes video that describes this graphic in detail. So here I only want to express that we re need to recognize that life expresses itself in pulsation. Whatever is alive, pulsates. So on this graphic, my cursor doesn't go, but you see that in the middle expressed. I call this the pulsation of being. And in this dynamic, we bring our essential qualities into life and develop a body, emotions and feelings, our cognitive capacities, and we act in life with our will. All this forms the consciousness of the personality, which is initially limited, since it is based on our genetic makeup, our family, society, religion, and so many other conditions. However, we can observe that the interaction of our body reactions, emotions, feelings, our cognitive capacities, and the experience in our fields, and the functioning of our brain allows mind to emerge, which then contributes to the creation of a personal field of consciousness, in which the degree of awareness represents the measure of consciousness which enables us to connect with the primary or universal field of consciousness and contribute to it. So this is a key concept here for me, because I call this a participatory consciousness, an active process 
where actual and potential information are mutually transformed into each other. So possibly we come back to that in our question. So the state of love supports a flow in which we are open to the unified field of consciousness, in which we not only sense ourselves as material reality like a particle, we also experience our wave-like nature, in which we can receive and transfer energy and information in the speed of light and therefore can instantly connect globally. Of course, the brain has a role in mediating consciousness, but only in limited ways takes part in creating personal consciousness. Eric Kandel, the neuroscientist who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of neuroplasticity, expresses in his textbook, The Principle of Neuroscience, we do not know so far how the firing of specific neurons leads to the conscious perception, even in the most simple case. That means that so far we completely lack an adequate theoretical model how an objective phenomena like the firing of a neuron can become a subjective experience such as pleasure or love. Therefore, in my work, the consciousness of the body or of the personality is not just in the brain, but it is what I call in our whole body-mind field. So when I talk about the body or in my therapy, I always mean the body-mind field, which is static. It is influenced by internal organismic functioning, social interactions, and countless cosmic information. That means representing an ever-changing energy pattern on numerous levels of existence, constantly changing with every breath. So it's like a never-ending symphony of life in which we are the conductor. Einstein already expresses there is no place in quantum physics for the field and matter, for the field is the only reality. So we are vibratory beings in the spectrum of subtle energy and dense matter. And these waves are a nice simplification. If you imagine yourself being in the center of a ring of waves, then you can get an idea of how we live and interact and communicate. I mean, imagine you would be more conscious and walking with your feet and we become aware when we are, I would not say bumping into each other, but when we merge our fields or repel them. So it would bring a whole different way of communication and interaction. So from the consciousness of our personality, also understood as ego, we describe that we create consciousness and the world due to our brain activity and the creation of our mind. At least that is what present psychology and neuroscience tells us. However, Planck, Max Planck suggests that the material world may be derived from consciousness and not the other way around. So does primary consciousness create us and the world? If primary consciousness creates a material world, then it may not depend upon this or another world to exist. The conclusion would be that consciousness itself does not need a brain to exist. Let me expand here for a moment in sharing that one of my early teachers had been Jiddu Krishnamurti. And in 1973, during a visit at his school in Brockwood Park in England, I got also introduced to the physicist David Bohm. 
And I was very intrigued by Krishnamurti and Bohm, the dialogues about the implicit order as a deeper fundamental order of reality and Bohm's concept of the holographic universe in which each part contains the information of the whole. So with this expansion of physics and general thinking, we could now see the probability how we can access information of all times. And I would like to share here another experienced phenomena in relation to the information of all times. About 25 years ago, I was traveling in a motorhome through Arizona to visit a 103-year-old healing practitioner. I stopped, as you can see, at Monument Valley to make a tea, leaning at the car and zipping my tea and looking into the landscape. A sudden wind hits me from the high desert. I intensely listen. My body and all my systems are alert. There is a call I have to follow. I jump into the car and nervously drive into the valley and let myself be guided to a part of the valley without people. I walk then into the vastness of the valley. The wind comes up again and the valley fills with people from a time long gone. A male and female elder leader guide a woman about my age towards me. They speak a language I don't know, but I understand. The woman and I should be messengers and go into the world and teach the wisdom of the light beyond all cultures and boundaries. With the fading image, I had a deep desire to lie down on the ground to integrate the experience in relation to the land. But in that moment, a Navajo Indian on a horse with his sheep herd came by and did not, and I didn't want to look too strange as a white man and walked back to my car. This left some part of the experience incomplete and to a small degree unintegrated in me, which I will later document in my biophoton research. But as a side note, translating this experience into my reality, I realized that in this life, I studied ethnology, anthropology, education, psychology, I met Professor Pop, the foremost researcher on biological light at the time, and I teach now on four continents. So, so far I fulfilled a great part of this vision. Furthermore, we will see that any energetic impulse, like I described right now, that does not get harmoniously integrated into our system, and interferes with the free flow of life can become a disturbing form giving force. We hold then images as representations in our body mind field, the images of this experience. And whether it's our own experience or an image that we call in or that we tap into. Images in the field of consciousness are psychophysical emotional processes and the energetic impressions into our body mind field. So, these are other important concepts in my work. So, since my near death experience, I had been gifted to perceive light and energy phenomena around and between people which did not make my use easier to find integration into a materialistic world. But it kept my interest alive to connect with healers, shamans, researchers, and to document how emotional, 
mental and other processes can structure our body-mind field. So for that, I began over 35 years ago with Killian photography. Some of you may recall pictures like that, where a certain part like the tip had been cut off, but you can still see the radiance of the hole. Then I went into medical Killian photography, where we take pictures of the uh, meridian flow at the hand and the feet then moved on to a more direct measurement with infrared analysis where the research is just below the visible spectrum. So first I would like to show you from my practice how images can be held or called into our body-mind field. So here you see this research was also done with a German Medical Acupuncture Society. That's why we also look at meridian-like structures. But I would like to come more to the expression of this person here, this woman here, that almost looks like she has a beard, of course, which she doesn't have. So how we, we do the exploration in inquiring with that person who can also see herself on a screen and wonders what that appearance is. So I ask her, is there anybody in your past, in your family, in your ancestors that had a beard like that? And first she couldn't come up with anything and then she recalls, you know what? On the desk of my mother, there's always a small picture of her grandfather who was quite a patriarch but in the two world wars in Germany, he always took care that the family had something to live on, to stay with, and he held the family together. Now we got to see here as a medical client, uh, she's suffering two different kinds of cancers. Her organism is uh, to a degree falling apart and she's in separation. Uh, after 30 years of relationship. So her life is falling apart. How now the process of looking for somebody who could hold life together and uh, support her making it through and how such an image of such a person who was so unconscious in her mind comes so much into the forefront, how she calls that image in, that will require some more research. So a second example I want to document how we hold information also in form of emotions in our system and how the body-mind field can express and modify it. So that means that would document that change is possible. I mean we see that all the time in our practice. Because in our therapeutic energetic approach of coevolution, we work towards the integration of traumatic information, which can limit the actual pulsation of life in a person, whether it's originating from individual to collective trauma or any other form of information. Information that distorts the flow of energy. And with that, limits also the capacity for the flow of love, as you could see. As a resonance with the flow of life, as soon life is uh, distorted or limited, we also limit the flow of love. So here we see an infrared image with a temperature scale. In general, irregularities of one and a half to two degrees Celsius can indicate distortions in the energy flow, which can become clinical symptoms. When they create blockages, they may become psychosomatic appearances and interfere with the flow of energy and information within ourselves, within the, with the world around us, and with all existence. So as you can see here at the root of the nose, we see a strong temperature difference of four to six degrees which represents an energy block. From the story I know later it's from a hit she received by accident from her father 
and by time here now I cannot go into that unfortunate story here so you cannot see any physiological sign in the visible face so when the person is staying in front of you so I know we are dealing here with an emotional scar and it's important to understand and know that every scar whether physical or emotional holds the information of the time of the experience So what will happen when we support the flow of energy in that area? What will happen when we support to open the block? That is what I regularly invite clients to in my work, uh, body-oriented, trauma-informed, and mindfulness-centered therapist. Then energy flows. And this year is in a couple of seconds. And when energy flows, the story flows, the story opens up and emotions flow. That's of course why we hold them in there. Then of course we need to have the competence and the capacity to process and integrate the material so that the natural flow of light in terms of photons can inform the system to sustain and establish coherence. That is when the real process of healing then takes place. This, of course, requires an expanded understanding of memory, including principles beyond our present description of brain function. In spring of 1975, so quite some while ago, I met Carl Prybram, a neuroscientist from Stanford, who was developing and researching his theory of the holographic memory at that time, that every cell and cell formation holds information. And at the moment of memory, all parts of an experience, from wherever in the subtle or dense field of the body, in the speed of light, contributes to collect information so that the brain and other systems form the energetic information to a gestalt of experience that we then hold as a representation in our system. So that's a quite different energetic explanation of memory and possibly uh, the closest one that we understand here in talking about quantum physics, consciousness, and so on. Because in this way, we recollect an experience since it exists as wave functions in non-local space. And translated in relation to the holographic universe, we can now understand that we could tap and reach into the memory of all times and totally expand the role of the brain. I mean, we know from our own organization here, we have that long-standing Congress beyond the brain going into that. So, and as you can see, according to the holographic principle and string theory, the electrons in a carbon atom in the human brain are connected to the subatomic particles that comprise every salmon that swims, every heart that beats, and every star that shimmers in the sky. So it describes our connectedness and how can we with normal neuroscience even encompass it, you know. So in some lectures uh, that I give on psychology congresses, I describe several areas of perception that are perceived and processed independent of the brain. Maybe I can bring that in one day, David, on the Beyond the Brain Congress. So mostly participants don't really want to hear about it for good reasons because it would require to open your mind for a whole new paradigm of how we see ourselves and how we practice in humanities in psychology in healing sciences and so on so to describe that we, what we still call extraordinary perception and principles beyond our present explanatory models. 
Of course, we like to quote quantum physics. However, with all the discussions we have about consciousness and quantum physics, some questions still remain. Does every material form or appearance have an energetic mold? Does form really emerge from thought, the thought field or other fields? Prigogine lays out in his work, Order Out of Chaos, Order Out of Chaos, in a system far from thermodynamic equilibrium, a microscopic order can arise spontaneously. That means without being directed by an outside force or by a blueprint. That means in that case, the self-organizing structure is itself creating a field and in this moment, a process of creation and manifestation is set into motion. And the emergence of a field will be inseparable from the structure that is created. It's a dynamic process. David Bohm called it the hollow movement, a dynamic phenomenon out of which all forms of material and universe flow. For a human being, this will be the creation of the body-mind field. And what does it mean for us on a personal level? Before I go there, I would like to share with you another personal experience that demonstrates the principles I just described. In a deep moment of centering, I find myself on a gentle mountain side overlooking rice fields in a long green valley. I'm in a state that I call a perfect stillness. For the physicist, I would call it possibly the zero point stillness. It's between life in an energetic equilibrium. There are no desires, no attachments, no I, no time no movement, no physical perception of existence, not even flow, just potential. A Zen monk comes up the hill and the spark of light emitted from his eyes invites me and I answer by taking a breath which activates my potential and in this decision-making moment I agree and decide to follow him. On gentle slopes, he guides me further down the mountain until we reach another pass. He motions me to follow that pass while he wanders off. And soon I see the wooden structure of an old Zen monastery. I step inside and become aware that all rooms are empty. They lead to a large wooden deck overlooking the valley. I sit down meditating, open for information where this will lead me. Here my actual experience is so ended, or I must better say past because I revisit that place regularly. Later I realized that from a state that I see as between lives, an activating moment of the potential took place. Remember the light in the eyes of the monk, which I affirmed with my intention and breath, and with that activating my intention into movement. Out of this experience and my cooperation for years with the Native American Vision Quest, I developed a process that I call Intention Quest. 
So on this graphic, the cursor doesn't work, but on the right upper side, you see uh, in the intention quest, I guide participants into a primordial space in which they have the chance to connect again with their intention for this lifetime. To reach their intention and activate their volition. In that moment, you connect with the formative powers of manifestation that were set into motion and that informed the structuring of the system. Often, due to live experiences, we find arriving on this earth here, and due to the process of protecting our vulnerable essence, most of us had lost the connection with this moment of clear intention. And I bring the intention or this connection to this intention back in my work. For this, I developed some processes. So, in the intention quest, then the person then reinitiates him or herself into the awakening of the consciousness of the body mind field. And once a person touches into this process, therapy or healing or self-realization goes in quantum leaps as you can imagine because potential then becomes the empowerment of i the identification which leads in the further unfolding to a conscious embodiment and ultimately mindful presence That, of course, brings in the question, how do we participate in this process? And how does the question of free will come in here? How do we reach a state that I call participatory consciousness? Well, the power of life in the dance of chaos and form requires a healthy ground to affirm the form and structure. And our sense of grounding, that means here the feeling of being connected with myself, others, and the world around me, and our state of health is defined by a stable coherence of our vibratory field. In our global coevolution training, we call it the matrix of grounding. So if such a program is of interest to you, I send you the 12th page curriculum that we begin in May again, another program. So coherence is the quality of forming a unified whole with the ability to sustain form and to give direction to the energy, that's the important part. As I expressed before, in our work we teach people how to structure energy and intention. As you see that I, again on the right upper part, intention and volition, and we call that, you see it on the lower part on the right side, practice in being, that becomes the practice in being. That means a continuous process of reconnecting with the original intention and the pulsation of being by practicing mindfulness and open up the consciousness of the personality, as we could see, is always limited, but it yearns for it, longs for the connection with the primary, with the universal consciousness. Because a lack of this coherence on a personal level leads to disturbances that we deal with in psychotherapy, like fear, trauma, panic attacks, even psychosis, and other forms of disintegration. That's why I wanted to find out how a field can be structured with intention and volition, and how the state of consciousness can influence our flow of energy, and if light in form of biophotons is the intermediate for this process. 
So for the non-physicists of us here, a photon is an electromagnetic field. And as an elementary particle, it is a quantum of radiant energy. If produced by a biological system, then we call it biophoton. And it is suggested that biophotons are created in the DNA of our mitochondria. And through the changes of our metabolism, it's released as light that we then can measure as ultra weak photon emission. So our cellular system communicates, of course, by chemical and by electric reaction, but also to a great deal information is transmitted by light. So we communicate with light. In the past, it was quite a spiritual statement. Today, it's physics. So since our bodies emit light in a certain pulsation, I wanted to know if I can influence the flow of light with my consciousness. That's where I visited Professor Pop again. We knew each other for a long time, for 35 years, with different congresses from the Killian photography and so on and so on, until we met again later through other doctors and the infrared research, and then again in his conferences uh, that he had in his institute. So here you see the biophoton chamber uh, that's totally locked up so that no light can come in, the light can go out. And we measure the light, we measure the photons that emit from my hand. And the physicist then sits outside and takes a measurement so that we can validate them. And first I went and went in full concentration. Since I long time experience with Zen and uh, meditation, I can go and concentrate my energy and I direct my energy and direct my light, so to say. So the first is with direct, uh, what, what shall I say, aligning my energy. And aligning is the right word because you can see the outpour of photons in a quite exciting way. And then you see in the lower left part, it's very aligned, so it's very coherent, and my coherent index is one. In the second part then, I took that image in that I talked about in Monument Valley that I could not complete. And even though it doesn't create fear in me or any di disturbance, it is just not integrated. But still, let's see what it does. So, I have a similar excitation outpour of photons, but as you can see on the lower left side, they flow very chaotic. So, and my coherent index on the right lower side is zero. So, and this when I show that, and that was important for me that in research to show it to a psychologist and psychiatrist, if a person stays in that condition, then you will become aware, they get nervous, they get fidgetary, um, the eyes uh, go up and down, so then the breathing goes restless, and sooner or later, this person will lose the inner ground and then possibly also have difficulties in relating in society. I like to mention here one more aspect. Uh, possibly most of you who ha have meditated, they perceive another lightness, a radiance within you and around others. So nevertheless, we also had some research in biophotons that states uh, that the ultra-weak emission during and after meditation, there were much less. So there was much less emission of light. And as I said, 
almost most of us agree that experienced meditators seem to be surrounded by a certain radiance, a certain luminescence. So what do we perceive if the activity of the biological light was according to objective measurement reduced? Is there another quality of light beyond electromagnetics or frequency? Is there another quality of light that entwines in the human eye with the state of love as a resonance with the flow of life? It is clear that we need the courage to move towards the science and understanding of life that includes love and the human light expressed in luminosity, radiance and the activity of biophotons to create a coherent body-mind field so that we connect with and expand the dimension of consciousness. That is what I call participatory consciousness where the consciousness of the personality merges with the primary consciousness. In this moment, we sense the unity and oneness of all existence. You see that on the right side, the centering in essence, the unity, the oneness. As you know by now, love is an open state. We set supporting the coherent flow of the living system. That means that your love, intention and coherent energy, your fully embodied presence and the will of your heart can now contribute to the unified field of experience and fold it in a new reality of that moment. Of course, we will continue to find models that explain that we are all in one consciousness in the holographic universe and that we can exist simultaneously in the past and the present and influence our future. That's actually where I live. So, but bottom line is the intention for this life is born in love. Love as a resonance with the flow of life and the intention to experience. It is always good to remember that life is precious and that in this manifestation and representation of you now, in this body, at this time, on this planet, in this universe, with this accumulated experience and in exact combination and appearance that you are, this is it. There will never be another you. So more I invite you to connect with your infinite potential, to sense into your essence, inquire into your journey in life, connect with the power of all existence, become aware of your unique qualities and express and realize them in the world. So thank you for your supportive presence tonight. I think that's where I pause for a moment so that we have a chance. Uh, and a chance, maybe. Yes, thank you. I talk to David to maybe. Can yeah. I just suggest that we <clears throat> that you lead us in a short exercise or meditation yeah. before we 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 break because you, we seem to be in a nice flow state. It uh, should, if, right. If you yeah if right you come back after we've gone and, and and sort of come out of the flow. So if you exactly. could just exactly right. Yes, I like something that. with us before the break. That would be great. Yeah, that's my intention to end at that place where you are connected with yourself and with all these moments that we try to understand in life and bring the flow of love back. So for that, 
Of course, let me invite you to sit comfortably. And that doesn't mean a meditation pose, it just means centering comfortably. And direct your attention to your breathing, just to your breathing as it is, without needing to pull or push. And with your next two, three out breaths, extend the out breath for two, three seconds. Out, out, out. So that you feel a natural pull of the intake and extend it a little bit more again. And flow back in, in a natural way, allowing your chest also to be filled. And with your next out breath, allow the breathing and the energy to go through your body, through your belly, pelvis, legs, directly into your feet, into the ground, so that you can take the next in-breath from the ground up through your legs, into your pelvis, belly, chest, to the top of the head. And allow the out breath again to the ground. And allow it to be a soliton wave that you be in. Your life have to be in that wave that breathes in and allow the flow out. I breathe in and I take life in. And I breathe out and I surrender to the flow of life. And let yourself stay for a couple of breaths in this flow and feel the unity that it creates. And in this flow of energy, in this flow of light, let yourself see how you can sustain it and expand it when you zoom out and you see yourself in your whole room, radiating, allowing the pulsation of life out. And in slow motion, you even zoom further out. You see your area where your house is. That land or the city around it. See the people and you still sustain the breathing and share that state with the existence that you become aware of. And in that slow zooming out, you even see the earth. See the whole planetary system and you become aware of the larger existence that you are part of. And you become aware that you are breathing. And gently let yourself zoom back in. Very slow. That 
the universe, the earth, your continent, your country, your city or your land, your room, feeling yourself on the seat where you are, knowing that you have the capacity to radiate all the time in this way. And you may even take your right or left hand and you just put your fingertips onto the upper sternum, just where your heart may be. And with your out breaths, let yourself breathe into the heart of another person that you would like to share this energy with. That is a state of flow, the state of love that you can radiate. And of course, that you can give yourself. And feel still the breathing that goes from the top of your head to the feet. And you stay in the clear matrix of grounding. Knowing who you are. Participating in this world. And contributing with your personal consciousness to the primary consciousness. So you fully participate in this life, in this world, in this universe. It's wonderful to meet you all in this state. I thank you. Thank you so much, Sigma. Uh, tell us a little bit about this image here. I, I love that. I was going to say we conspired, <coughs> which means literally to breathe together yeah. uh, into a state of coherence. Right. So I'm, I'm mm. certainly feeling that myself. But it's a beautiful image. Where, 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 what's the story? It is a very, very small piece from a tanka. Okay. That I once, one that I once saw in Dharamsala. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's quite, quite kind of hypnotic's not the right word, but it draws you into its patterns. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's a great part of my work that I have on many flyers and many brochures. So that it's it encompasses it just the best graphic I could find. You know. Mm. <clears> that beautiful. Would be but we are, and it's we, like the, the blue is the mind and the red is the heart and it's all the hearts at the center and so i think you've got an information slide at, at the oh end. yeah yeah well thank you very much that that was fascinating interesting and and beautifully presented and paced you know taking us through these various aspects in your wonderful diagram and the intention and bringing the will in which i think is so important it's rather neglected. I'm going to take a question next before coming to Peter um, from Darren asking about your thoughts on research that validates observable human physical healing i.e. recorded changes in anatomy and physiology that's been facilitated between a healer and a client um, that has a recorded injury or ailment when a factor of the treatment is coherence, intention and participatory consciousness. Is this a random subtle phenomenon or something that can be developed for more regular and sustained physical healing? Yeah, it's both. So I've done that for years. So I lived for 20, 25 years and worked with doctors in both ways, alternative doctors, clinical doctors, um, and, in, and with healers and documented them. And I could see how healers 
stuck clients empty and the clients were not becoming aware of it because they were so infatuated by being in the process. But an hour later, they collapsed and they were tired and exhausted. Uh, we see this all the time. I know we wish there would be an easy way that we can just meditate on healing or that we would just uh, would have a spontaneous remission and so on. Unfortunately, our body doesn't function that simple. There are so many factors involved. So sometimes belief does it, sometimes not. So in that respect, uh, it can be sometimes denial. I have questions, I have clients that have been so in denial of their beginning cancer that the cancer went away. So yeah. it, since then I learned, I don't challenge anything. I don't, if that works, for, if perfect denial works, yes. What doesn't work is if you have doubts. If it doesn't work, if you're not uh, in your feelings honest. And if you are in perfect denial, you always feel you're right. So in that respect, uh, we got to also look at you know, the cystic nature and so on and so on. There are other issues. But in terms of healing, I've done a lot of before and after work and testing. Uh, we did a whole series uh, with six, seven different practitioners. We had a five-day workshop once with 12 people from all over the world where we could see, wow, this chiropractic correction had such an impact on that person on that other person when he took out his uh, tooth so that was the silver filling you know the bridge that he had everything came back into flow and coherence as soon as he put that back in again there was an interruption in the energy flow you know as i mentioned it some of the part of the research has been done with the german acupuncture society so in that respect, and I supervised uh, sometimes students from a healing school and could see somewhere just in belief system and didn't see anything. And then they cannot also address the personality. So how much are you in the way of your healing? How much can you become part of your healing? And how much can you just open up for that space that uh, the other person asked for the non-dual state. So uh, I've seen it all and I have seen not a regularity and I would never promise anything. There are too many factors involved. So, and we must see there are different levels. When I have a 74 year old client coming to me and uh, said, I would like to work with you. And she knew I had a near death experience and I don't fear the topic of death so much. And she said, I want to work on death with you. And I said, wow, what brings you here? I have a triple cancer and I would like to be. And I said, you know what? I'm not a doctor. And if you haven't been really checked, I really would like that you do that too. She said, no. I I've gone through that. I've done everything I could. Now I want to search for another healing. Wow, that energy shifted in the room, you know. So uh, it was not anymore that she said, I want to heal my body. I want to heal. I want to heal in a much larger aspect. So whether the healing of the body can come out of that, that can also take place. So that's, that's a wonderful situation. So Darren, I'm sorry that I cannot give you this, how it is, that how it goes. Um, we have done so many experiments and working with uh, doctors that we did also with some frequency because with color frequency, uh, tuning forks, acupuncture, uh, correction, as I said, of structural alignment, meditation, uh, under injection, neural therapy, so everything, you know, and see, because with the infrared, you see immediately what's happening. So that's why I wonder why it's not more often used. I think for both reasons. It's possibly not known, and sometimes you may fear it, because you can see change immediately and whether change 
flow. So, and where you would need to support the process still. So, it gets used for uh, early breast cancer uh, analysis if there is an aggressive breast cancer that has heat. So, for that, it's very much used and in practice. So, in that respect, healing is a wide topic that I have another uh, presentation for that I once gave. I don't know whether we met there at Irving Laszlo about the new uh, concept of healing. So, yeah, this is a wide topic. So, Thank you. Yes, Thank you. It can take place, but I have also documented many other moments where the healer had no impact. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's very individual, as you say. Um, Peter, um, you have a question. You just need to unmute yourself. Doing that. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. It's a really lovely talk, and I enjoyed that very much, and I very much like the relationship between light and love. Um, but I have a question. Um, I know a man, and I think some of the people here would also have met him a uh, weekend before last. He started meditating in his 20s, meditated solidly throughout his life, uh, had birth first breakthrough at 26, and then the second one was about, about 30, 35. And with the second one, uh, he found that he could uh, generate light in himself, uh, which other people would see. When you ask him what he's doing, he's saying, I'm just standing back in the void. I'm not there. So he, he takes no responsibility for it in any way, but he opens the door and the light comes through him. We did an interesting experiment uh, there, there must have been about a hundred of us that day and we gave people scales of one to five uh, to rate the strength of the light and in essence it was about a third couldn't see him, two thirds could and one third uh, extremely well. So uh, he's in Monaco and in this experiment, uh, we're all scattered around the world on Zoom, but yet a large number of people can see him when he gives light. Uh, I've sat in front of him, and it's certainly easier to see there, but you can see it quite easily on Zoom. And uh, with the light, you sometimes get quite a lot of energy which flows into you. And of course, we did all the uh, experiment you'd expect, take photographs, do all that sort of thing, you see nothing. And so this is something inside, inside of you. We also did some experiments where we looked at the relationship uh, between the two brains of the people, and you certainly, in fact, show that there is a linking up of, of the brain rhythms if the two people are in the same room. I don't know its uh, distance yet. Now, what is going on here? Uh, our first thought would buy a photons, but that's not going to figure, and it certainly won't figure if you're using Zoom. Um, is it, uh, it's obviously a city he's developed, but what I would like your view on is what actually is happening. Goes into the void, the light comes through him, we see it, and it's transformative in you at times. So what is this? Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so, Peter, maybe you come into my cave in the Himalaya and I will answer you that question. So, but uh, you asked me a similar question some years ago in San Diego when we met. You were in my lecture there. So, yes. and, <laughs> <laughs> and it's of course when you tap what he calls or what we call into the void. Sometimes the moment that we reach in meditation when we are experienced meditators. So uh, then the space opens up what Krishna Muti calls in meditation there's no room for you. Meditation happens when you are not there. Hmm. So that means you open up 
of the ego, the open up of the personality so that energy can flow and with that the capacity of light can flow. And that was my example that I brought. Is there another quality of light that's beyond photons? So, and that's why we cannot measure it and that's why we don't take it in in part of the research. So, because it's a very subjective intertwining of an energy, uh, it's the connection that you establish with the person. It almost comes closer almost to the artist, to the painter, that says, I paint as the light comes to me. I'm not painting what you see. So, in that respect, uh, this connection can be established, of course, just by entanglement, as you know or by you are connected to that light because that field is wave-like and we can connect into it. The question then is how do you connect with that person? Because it, otherwise you would not identify that person anymore. It would be just light. In that moment when somebody says, I see him, then they don't see him. Mm. Then, they, then, then they see an image that they have of that person with that light but if he says i'm light you know and you see him as a person in the light there's the conflict there's exactly the beginning of the i and it's a very interesting state i totally agree we make that contact that what you do on sunday morning we come into a space where we all connect we go into a larger field but you are still Peter, you got to lead that, uh, you lead in meditation. I mean, I do meditation group with my friend Zen Master, we call Zen Mindfulness and Psychotherapy, and sometimes I sit there and would just love to continue. And then I know, okay, I got to ring the bell in 25 minutes and do the teaching, you know? So, but exactly that's where I feel we can tune into that field and then we can, I will not say merge, but there is a oneness. So the only thing and that, what as I mentioned before to Abstrado, where Buddha didn't answer, how then we can come back to us? How do you go in the bardo state and you wake up in the morning and you are you again? So that is the interesting part of that commitment for life, the decision-making process, uh, where you have the intention to be you for this lifetime and to bring your volition back in and the capacity to let go again. That's the art. So that's, yeah. Thank you. I, Thank you. I've, I have actually, you know, as Peter knows, I, I have seen um, the light when I was with Alain Forger and, mm -hmm. uh, and he just disappeared. His whole face disappeared into light. His whole body yeah. disappeared into light. Yeah. See, when I have been gifted with seeing energy, and I do that, I don't talk about much with, with clients, but I take it into account as, as an analysis. I sometimes even close my eyes. I see something better with my eyes closed. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah that's very true. <laughs> so, and then it, that's what we do. Yeah, so that is disappearing into the light. What is that mechanism you're asking for? Or what is that moment of connecting on that thing? Mm. And I think I, that's, the, that's the beauty of merging and people who are in love, not in love with yourself, in love with the universe, but in love with another person. That's where we meet, and that's unfortunately the issue in couple therapy that I also do a lot, that people have seen the expanded state of the other person. But then in everyday life, our personality calls us back, but we still know the beauty of the other person and ask ourselves, why is that person not living it? That's where all the conflict then arise. Mm. 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 How can we expand this space again? Right, yeah. Thank you very much. It's a very yeah. nice reply. 
in fact, I'm a really, common field. Yes. Yeah. I really have you. I still have great pictures from you and your wife. I need to send it to you. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I think you've, you've talked a little bit about you know, Christine's question about intentional conscious and conscious or intention related to non-dual conscious state. Would you want to say a little bit more about that? I will do a little bit because you mentioned the will. Yeah. Uh, and I consciously bring the will in. I'm not, even though I, I had, I studied Indology for one and a half year, you know, and the Vedic scripture and so on, but I'm not coming from get rid of your ego and uh, everything will work. So no, I'm inviting us in this life to have a will because you need to structure life and for that you need the capacity of the will. So if the will becomes an obstacle in the realization of the larger connectedness, yeah, then you have an issue. And then we got to look at that. Uh, so in that respect, what we just talked about is with Peter, you step into a non-dual space, but then who's driving the car? Hmm. So it's great, you know? So that then the question is how do you come back and know that state and that what i call walking zen you do what needs to be done in that state so it's not something whether i it's not just a state of meditation uh, when i was well, in the 70s i looked for community then i stayed in one zen community and every morning from seven, from seven to eight o'clock it was our time, or from 6.30 to 7.30. It was our time. Nobody could interrupt, even the kids not, you know. And here was a little kid, you know, that fell from his tricycle, you know, was a little bit bleeding on the side, was standing at the glass in the window and crying, and nobody reacted. That was their time of meditation, you know. So, and I felt that's impossible, you know. So, I get up. I attended to that little boy for a couple of minutes, gave him a little band-aid and heart came, and then he ran off again like kids do, and I went back into sitting, you know. So it is meditation is to do what needs to be done in life. And that what creates as a non-duality also. You don't separate yourself from what's going on. And you know that there's a much larger connection that we are all in so that's where i in my graphic you could see it be moving from uh, unity to duality when we embody and what we also call in buddhism then is unity in duality so to experience again the unity of oneness in the duality of being so yeah. spiritual being spiritual beings in the physical body and that is what you came for that's the experience. And that way, all of the Buddhists say, it's not easy to get a body. So don't think you just come back, you know. So cherish what you have. That's why my ending of my talk, you know. So and live it fully and bring in full experience. So that's the power. That's mm. empowerment and mindful presence. That's how you bring both together. Thank you. Well, we, we've got about five minutes left, so I think okay. we'll maybe just devote ourselves to another little bit of quiet practice before we wind up. Um, yeah. So over to you. Okay. And as always, um, <clears throat> centering is always very helpful to bring the attention to the breathing, the attention to the breathing always. And then in my teaching on mindfulness, I always first invite and I say, can you take a breath in the past? Mm. Then try to take a breath in the future. Not so easy either. So just allow yourself to breathe and know that you can only breathe in the present. And with that, life can only take place in the present. So when you allow with your next in-breath to take the energy uh, into your pelvic area 
and let it circulate there. So you let it enlighten. It's almost you allow almost to take out, so you allow your photons also to be active. You allow you feel that energy in your lower belly. And in my work, it's totally okay if you also want to take your fingertips and maybe palpate a little bit if you feel tension or sense it, or just put your hands there and breathe into that area. And with your next intake, you take the breath and the energy from your pelvis into your belly. And let it circulate there. Circulate need to expand with your next couple of breaths into that area, also to the back, that means your sacrum. And since your mics are muted, feel free to also have an open out breath, like, ah. And with your next intake, guide that energy and your breathing through your pelvis, through your belly, into your solar plexus area. And again, allow the whole circle to open. The solar plexus area is your diaphragm. See how much you can allow it like wings to move with the breath. I should feel tight on the solar plexus. Don't hesitate. Gently go there. Always also feel hands on. And out so that you can come with the next in breath and breathe the energy and your breath in through your pelvis, your belly, your solar plexus area into your heart area. And if you want to put your hand there again, feel free. Feel with your right hand, your left intercostal muscle from your left side. Your left hand, you can gently massage the intercostal muscle on your right side. So that you can also expand into your right side. Through your back and the whole lung capacity. And with your next intake, allow the energy and your breathing through your pelvis, belly, solar plexus, heart region, into your throat region. Feel free to maybe move your neck with a micro movement. Open your jaw. Ah, so that you can just, with your out breath, almost you allow going to the window and Ah, be the gentle outflow of your breath. Mm. And with your next in breath, guide that energy and your breathing through your pelvis, belly solar plexus region, heart region, throat, into the forehead, what we sometimes call the third eye. If you want to take your hand and gently massage it or open your eyes, your eyebrows. And see whether you can guide the energy with your breath into that area.
And normally I would take three, four minutes for each area that we are breathing into. But when you do it on your own, And give it a conscious out-breath, out, 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 out. So that with your next in-breath, I can invite you to guide the breath through your spine, up your spine, directly under the skull, where you can allow that energy to come out from your skull like a fountain that flows down at the periphery of your body like liquid light. And with every in-breath, you allow the same in-breath through your spine or along your spine, through your neck, release your neck and comes on the center of your skull, emerges, comes out and flows down at the periphery of your body like liquid light. and stay in the flow. While I read you, only breath. Not Christian, Jew or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen, not any religion or cultural system. I'm not from the east or the west, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or a serum, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist. I'm not an entity in this world or the next. Did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless a trace of the traces, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one, and that one called to and know. First, last, outer, inner, only that breath-breathing human being. Who me? So, thank you so much for your deep presence that I sent with you and I could share. Yeah. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. uh, Zygmunt, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for your, your insights, your experience, your, your theoretical and healing understanding. You've given us a rich um, feast um, this evening and also sharing your being um, and just being able to breathe together to to meditate together just to be together which is what's so important even if it's a, a virtual form of togetherness and I, it still yeah. creates a sense of community uh, so um, thank you very much Andrew for the technical support and everyone for being with us this evening and um, looking forward to seeing you all again either on Sunday Sunday, Saturday, sorry, or next week, uh, or on other occasions. Anyway, it's been very nice to be with you, and thank you again. And that good night, everyone. Embrace. Yeah, that virtual embrace and mm. for the body oriented therapist, I yeah. love to have. Great, <laughs> wonderful, excellent. Sure.